Has anybody in here seen the movie Star Wars? How about all of them? Have you seen, who's seen all the Star Wars movies? Okay, so, so you guys will understand this one, this illustration, completely. I'll explain it for the rest of you. There's a Star Wars, uh, when you watch the first one that came out in the 70s, you think it's about Luke Skywalker. When you watch all of them, you realize it's not about him at all. It's about this Darth Vader bad guy. And the whole movie is about his fall and redemption at the end. But so in the third episode of it is the fall of there's this, this Jedi Knight named Anakin Skywalker. But he is going downward and descending into darkness and into anger and hatred. And as he's descending into this darkness, he has a wife named Padme. And at, the, at a critical moment at, toward the end of the movie, when he's really descending into absolute darkness, his wife confronts him, and she wants him to turn away from the path that he is on, the path toward the dark side in the movie. And she desperately wants them to continue their loving relationship together. But Anakin refuses and he persists in his destructive path. And at that moment in the movie, Padme tells him this. She says, this is lying right out of the script, and it's filled with so much spiritual information. She says, I don't know you anymore, Anakin. You're breaking my heart. I'll never stop loving you, but you are going down a path I can't follow. And then she walks away. She knows that although her love for him is not going to change, that the relationship has been broken. The relationship has been severed by his destructive decisions. And because she loves him so much, this causes her great grief. And in fact, in the movie, she's pregnant and she dies as she's giving birth she dies from a broken heart. <coughs> and as I watched this, I saw that this is really a picture of the heart of God. You see, grief is proportionate to love. We know this every time that we attend a funeral. It's apparent to us that the greater the love, the greater the grief when there's that loss. And because Padme loved Anakin much, her grief was unbearable when he destroyed their relationship and it caused her death. What I want to con us to consider this morning is the effect that our decisions have on the heart of our Maker, on the heart of God. But for us to understand this, we first need to take a minute and understand God's great love for us. If grief is proportionate to love, we need to understand how much God loves us. And the scripture proclaims that God is love. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I love how the scripture says that. God is love. That's a remarkable thing to say. This is saying that love is a defining characteristic of God. If you ask me about my friend Steve, and you ask me, is Steve honest? And I tell you, yes, he's honest. That tells you one thing about Steve. But what if I answered your question by saying, are you kidding me? Steve is honesty. What have I told you? I've told you something more, haven't I? I've said not just that he's honest, but that honesty is the defining characteristic of his life. He embodies everything about it, and everything he does is consistent with it. I've gone way beyond saying he is honest by saying he is honesty. In the same way, to say that God is love tells us that we never have to doubt his love. That he It's a defining trait about him. And he embodies everything in the concept of that love. 
But what kind of love are we talking about? Of course, uh, it, it's, it's a particular kind of love. We use the word love much too broadly, describing different things. You've, uh, some of you have heard me share this before, that I love uh, my wife, I love piano music, I love coffee, and I love Notre Dame football. And I know that you have forgiving hearts about that. <laughs> but when I say those things, I'm not saying the same thing, am I? I better not be. <laughs> I'm saying entirely different things. We use the word love much too broadly and easily in the English language. We cover too many concepts with it. The Greek language is a little more precise. And the New Testament, at least, was written in the Greek language. And there's three main words for love in the New Testament. There's three main words for love in the Greek. The first is eros, and that's where we get the word erotic. That's romantic love. The next one is philio, and that's a brotherly love. You think of the city Philadelphia, and they say that's the city of brotherly love. From that philio, that's a brotherly love or an affection. That's the emotional bond that you can develop between people. And then there's a Greek word called agape, and that is the love we're talking about here. That is a benevolence, or a decision of your will to do what's best for somebody else, even at the expense of what you would want. That's the love that it used in the Greek when it says that God is love, it says God is agape. The opposite of that love is, of course, selfishness where we choose to seek our own desires, even at the expense of someone else. So think about that. God is love means it's his defining characteristic to do what's best for other people, even at his own expense. Now, God's love was the very basis of creation, the entire universe that we live in. We know that God is a trinity of persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know from the Scripture that this is three separate persons existing in a perfect loving fellowship, a perfect union of agape love. This is why the doctrine of the Trinity is so important and it's so spiritually exciting to me. Because if you think about it, the ultimate basis and ground of reality itself the ultimate basis of the universe that we live in is relationship and love. This is completely different from the concepts that deny the triune God. The uh, Islam or the Jehovah Witnesses or many other mistaken views of, of the God of God as a unity. Is God as just this single person who could be good or could be bad, could be some dictator of the universe. But the ultimate reality that we live in, the fabric of the universe, before any of this was, what existed was relationship and love. And I think that is so amazing to me. And this love between the three persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, was so beautiful and glorious that they decided to create mankind for the purpose of sharing in that loving fellowship. That's why we were made, was so that God could share some of that relationship and some of that love with us. We know Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. This image of God is not a physical likeness at all, but a spiritual one, that we are endowed with a free will that gives us the ability to choose love, to seek the highest well-being of someone outside of ourself. That's the image of God in us, that we can choose love. And God created us for the purpose of enjoying that loving fellowship with us. We are designed for love not for selfishness. And we glorify God by fulfilling that design, by living according to our intended purpose, and not by walking in selfishness. The writer C.S. Lewis describes God's love 
as a motive for creation this way. This is a remarkable statement that I read in his book. We were made not primarily that we may love God, though we were made for that too, but that God may love us. Let that sink in. The triune God that existed in relationship and love created us, not primarily for us to love Him, although certainly that's part of our design and what we're created to do. But His motive in creating us was not so that somebody could love Him. His motive in creating us was that He could love us. That's an amazing thing to realize. And God's love for us is eternal. And it's unchanging. It's immeasurable. In, Je- in Jeremiah 31.3, it reads, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God's love for us is everlasting. And in Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16, we get just a peek of how much He loves us. He says, Can a woman forget her sucking child? that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Surely the depth of a mother's love is, is amazing. But yet we are aware of times when even that can be broken. It says, yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. So God tells us more than a nursing mother loves her infant. He loves us. So it's eternal love. It's unmeasurable love. And God's love is the motive in redeeming us from sin. Our relationship with God was broken due to sin. Yet God loves us so much that He provided a way for us to return. We're well aware of Romans 5, verse 8. But God commendeth, or showed forth, His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in 1 John 4, verse 9 and 10, it describes it this way, the same principle. In this was manifested, or again, shown forth, in this was shown the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. This is what love is. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins or the the substitute, the sacrifice. And Jesus even endured the pain of the cross because of the joy that it would bring the Godhead to redeem us back into relationship with Him. We read this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand on the throne of God. Jesus could endure whatever they would do to him because he knew the joy that it would bring him and the Father and the Holy Spirit to restore that loving fellowship between God and man. So that's God's love toward us. And our response, of course, is to repent of our sins, put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again, be restored to that relationship and then to walk in love toward God and our fellow man, to follow his great example, and to live out agape love instead of selfishness. In 1 John 4, verse 19, it says, We love him, speaking of God, we love him because he first loved us. So our love toward God is our response toward his love that he shed for us. And and verse 11 of the same chapter, 1 John 4.11, says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. 
So the depth of the love that we just studied, that is the example and the motivation for us then to love God and to love other people in the same way that God has loved us. So because of these things, when we understand what love really is, then it's easy for us to understand the truth and the reality taught in Scripture that because God is love, then our choice to walk in the opposite of love, to walk in selfishness and sin, it still breaks that loving fellowship with God. It still severs that relationship. The scripture confirms this. We've got these scriptures listed for you. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God is able to save to the uttermost, and he's able to save anybody. If somebody's not saved, it ain't God's fault. He's done everything necessary for that to happen. If somebody's not walking in truth, it ain't God's fault. He's given everything necessary for that to be available to all men and women. But it's our decision to walk in rebellion and selfishness. Just like Padme told Anna. You know, I can't follow you. If we're walking on a path of selfishness, God's not there. Because he's walking on a different path. He's walking on the love path. If I'm on the selfishness trail, God's not there. Ezekiel 18.20 says, The soul that sinneth it shall die. That's a clear principle of God's kingdom. It's by necessity. It could be no other way. It's not like God says, Gee, if they sin, I'm going to lay down the law and they're dead. I mean, there is an aspect that we are judged and punished. But really, you think about it, it's, it's by necessity. The definition of being in a relationship with God is walking in agape love. The definition of walking in sin is refusing that and walking in selfishness. God cannot save anybody who's in sin. We repent of our sin. He provides the way of salvation when we're in our sin, obviously. But we must repent of sin to enter the kingdom. And we must continue to walk in holiness now. And if we sin to repent of that, we must continue on that path to remain in that loving fellowship with God. Amos chapter 3.3, you're all familiar with that passage. Can two walk together except they be agreed? (coughs) Not at all. It's like, you know, you go to different parks and they have different hiking trails and there's different trails, different paths. So God's on the love trail. If we want to be with God, we have to be on the love trail. If I'm walking the selfishness trail, God is not there. It's not God's fault he's not there. He can't be there because he is love. It's the defining characteristic of who he is. These principles are confirmed in the New Testament. People say, well, that's that's before the cross. Now, after the cross, we've got the blood of Jesus washes away all our sins. Yes, it does. Does that mean you can continue to walk in it, that grace may abound? God forbid. In 1 Corinthians 10.21, it tells us you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. What does that mean? Of course you can. You can drink one and then go and drink the other. And you can go back and drink one and drink the other. It means you can't drink them at the same time. There's no mixture. If you're drinking the cup of the devils, by definition, you're not drinking the cup of the Lord any longer. 
You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. At the same time, it's implied there. Because obviously we can make a change. Hallelujah. Because I used to be a partaker at the devil's table. And praise God that that could change. And now I can be partaker at the Lord's table. But that means still, I can change and go back to the devil's table. But I can't be a partaker at both tables at the same time. And in 2 Corinthians 6.14, it asks this question. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? And of course the answer is none at all. And in 1 John 1, 1.6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we're a carnal Christian. Is that what it says? No! What does it say? If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. This is God's word, that if I claim to be a Christian, but I'm walking in known sin and refusing to repent of it, I'm a liar, meaning I'm not a Christian, I'm not a follower of Christ. I have no part of Christ, no partaker at His table. I have no fellowship with God. And if I claim to have it, I'm lying. Fellowship with God requires that we walk in light, that we walk in love. Because God is love. Now, of course, in the Bible school, we've studied these principles <coughs> that sin separates us from God and the effect that that has now on us that we're eternally separated from God and destined for eternal suffering, torment of conscience. And uh, we're well aware of all of these principles. What I want us to look at today is the other side of the equation. I want us to examine what effect that separation has on God. And we must understand the risk that God takes in His great love for us. You remember we said that grief is proportionate to love. So the more God loves, the more risk He's taking of experiencing grief. C.S. Lewis describes the love, the, the risk, he describes the risk we take when we walk in agape love this way. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable. Impenetrable irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. Isn't that an amazing statement that he could make? That to love at all is to risk that grief by the brokenness of the relationship. Even Animals. You, we give our hearts to our pets, and they die before us. And it breaks our heart. You know, we give our love to somebody else, and they could refuse or reject that love. And cause us grief. But just think of the risk that God takes. We serve a God who risks because we serve a God who loves and the great risk that God takes is that He entrusts His heart to us, extending an offer of loving fellowship. That's amazing to me. 
that God is entrusting His heart to me. He takes the great risk of rejection. And when we reject Him through our sin, it breaks His heart. It breaks God's heart because it breaks the loving fellowship that He so earnestly desires with us. And these are the key scriptures in the outline that sin breaks God's heart. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, we study this when when we look at God uh, changing His mind. But we see the great grief, the broken heart of God. Genesis 6, 5 and 6 reads, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth. He was sorry he'd even made him. And here's our key today. And it grieved him at his heart. God's heart was grieved with the wickedness of mankind. And the word grief here in the Hebrew literally means to be in pain, to be grieved, to be hurt, to be tortured. God had created mankind, remember, for loving fellowship with him and with each other. And man's decision, choice to descend into darkness and sin pained God spiritually to the same extent that torture would cause physical pain. The word there, grieved him at his heart, means torture. So it breaks God's heart spiritually to the same extent that physical torture causes physical pain. So that gives us some more context to the Hebrews chapter 12 passage that we read that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. You see, Jesus could endure the physical pain of crucifixion because he had already experienced the same equivalent of that pain spiritually through the separation of the relationship with us. So the physical pain of the cross was no different than the spiritual pain he had already endured. In Isaiah chapter 63, verse 8 to 10, God says, it reads, For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior saying, surely they'll follow me. I love them so much. I've provided so much for them. Verse 9, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. So God is loving them and providing all these things for them, and he says, surely they'll love me back. Verse 10, But they rebelled their decision, their choice and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. And the word there, vexed his Holy Spirit, in the Hebrew it's the same exact word that's in the Genesis chapter 6 passage, that reads grieve. So when it says it vexed his Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean made his Holy Spirit mad. It means it grieved the Holy Spirit. It was torture to him to experience that. And Ezekiel, chapter 6, verse 9, gives us an amazing picture of the heart of God. Pete Smith, I think, was the first person that showed me this verse. And it just really opened my eyes. And you see, you let this verse sink in and this can change you. Ezekiel 6, verse 9. It says, And they that escape of you... Now this is he's speaking to the, the nation of 
Judah that now has been taken captive into Babylon. It says, They that escape of you shall remember me among the nations where they'll be carried captives. He says, Because I am broken with their whorish heart, which has departed from me, and with their eyes, which go a-whoring after their idols. And they shall loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abomination. But we see here, God says, My heart is broken because of their unfaithful heart. God's heart is broken because of our sinful choices. And the word broken here in the Hebrew means broken in pieces, crushed, broken hearted. In the medical field, mom said she's a transcriptionist, this would be what's called a comminuted fracture. A comminuted fracture is not easy to fix. It's when the bone is not just cracked, it's crushed into a bunch of tiny little pieces. Imagine you're a doctor and you've got to set that bone. There's nothing set. It's crushed into little pieces. This is when they've got to put in all the plates and all of that stuff. That's what sin does to God's heart. It breaks it into little pieces. Crushed, broken hearted. And the idea in the Hebrew includes an idea of trying to catch one's breath. Have you ever been so hurt emotionally when something catches you by surprise and it's so grievous that you feel like you can't breathe? That you can't catch your breath? That's what God says that sin does to him. That it's almost like he can't even catch his breath. It's like a punch to the gut. This now is the principal evil of sin. Not what it does to us, but what it does to God. All he's done is created us for loving fellowship with him. Provided everything we need. And when we choose to sin and walk in selfishness, it absolutely crushes him. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29, we get another amazing picture of the heart of God. He says, Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Do you hear the cry of God's heart saying, Oh, I wish that they would listen to me because it's best for them. The cry of God's heart is that we would obey Him for our good. Psalm 81 verse 13 says the same thing. He says, Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. God says, Oh, I wish they had listened to me. Have you ever had somebody that you cared about a lot, and they came to you for counsel, and you gave them godly counsel for their benefit, and you knew, based on the situation, based on what the Word said, based on your experience, you had no doubt this is exactly what they need to do. And you give them specific counsel that's going to help them out of that situation. And you care about them. Have you ever been in that situation? And then they don't do what you recommended to them. And they walk right in the midst of the pain. And that's, what, that's what's going on in this verse. It says, oh, that my people would listen to me. Because I wish they'd just do what I tell them to do. It's for their best benefit. Jesus cried out the same in Matthew 23, 37. When he cried out over Jerusalem, it's the same cry of God's heart, isn't it? He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. Notice this. I mean, we often look at this as he's proclaiming judgment on them, which he is. But notice the depth of love and forgiveness. And he says, Jerusalem, you've killed the prophets. You've stoned everybody I've sent to you. But even so, 
How often would I have gathered your children together like a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? Despite all the rejection that they had given, even at that moment in time, he says, if you would only listen and follow my ways, I would gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks. He says, but you would not. So God's heart cries out toward us but we reject him by our choice to sin against him. George Otis Jr., in his book, The God They Never Knew, The Tragedy of Religion Without Relationship. That is a tragedy, religion without relationship. He's got a a very good book where he talks about that, and he writes about pondering the remarkable truth about God that our sin causes him to suffer. And he describes it this way. Often I have pictured God, the mighty ruler of the universe, sitting on his throne with his face buried in his hands, weeping. Sitting on that throne is all the incomprehensible power of the universe under absolute control. Yet the adulterous behavior of his beloved touches the heart and feelings of of this mighty yet gentle being and the response causes the hosts of heaven to marvel. Where is there a more poignant sound than that of Jehovah sobbing? Who will stand by God in his hour of grief? that because God desired that loving fellowship with us, when we sin and break that fellowship, it breaks his heart. So, of course, when we understand that, then we can see that the harm that sin causes to God is the principal reason that we should avoid it. We show our love to God by obeying his commands. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, Keep my commandments. Very simple. And in 1 John 5, verse 3, it defines loving God. It says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. All He says is, Walk with me on the love path, on the love trail. Walk here with me. That's reasonable. That's doable. With His help to walk right alongside him. Therefore, holiness is is an essential part of our relationship with God. In John 17, verse 3, Jesus gives us a definition of eternal life. He says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So Jesus defines eternal life, and it's not a ticket to heaven. Eternal life is not praying a prayer, going to an altar, and saying, there I've got my ticket punched. Eternal life is a relationship with God that begins now. It's walking with Him on the love trail. And walking with Him there forever. And if we're walking with God on that love trail, the moment of our physical death, that will not change. We'll continue to be with God on that love trail forever. But if I'm on the selfishness trail where God is not there and I die on that trail, I'll be on that forever and God is not there. You see, physical death does not change our spiritual condition whatsoever. So that eternal life is to that, have that relationship with God now, continuing forever. In Hebrews 12.14, It admonishes us to follow peace with all men and holiness, to follow after holiness. Without which, it says, without holiness no man shall see the Lord. So holiness is not an option. 
like you get the born again plan, and then do you want you, you know do you you go and you buy something at the store, some electronic appliance, and they say, well, do you want the uh, three year protection plan or the five year protection plan? No, I just want the thing itself. I don't want to pay for your three year protection plan. That's not how it works. Like here's I want to buy the born again thing, but I don't want to buy the holiness package. <laughs> There's no option for that. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. But you see, holiness, when we walk on that path of love, when an opportunity for selfishness comes up and we cast it down and do the right thing and do the agape love thing, that brings God joy. In the same proportion that our sin breaks God's heart, when we obey Him, it brings joy to His heart. God rejoices in His people, those who have been redeemed and are in loving fellowship with Him. In Isaiah 62, verse 3 to 5, we get a picture of this. It reads, Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. We're a jewel. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called uh, Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delights in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. that young man on the day of his wedding, now you may kiss the bride. That moment in time, for those husbands in here, you remember that moment in time? You may kiss the bride and you lean over. What's in your heart toward that gal at that moment in time? I mean, there are, there are things that can come up in a relationship that you have to walk through and figure out a disagreement here or there, or stuff like that. Is any of that in your heart, in, in your heart at that moment in time? Not a bit of it. You may now kiss the bride. As the, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride in that moment in time, that is the joy that God has in His heart for you when you choose love and not selfishness. When you do the next right thing, that's the joy that God has. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, See, I think this verse is sort of a counterpart to the uh, Ezekiel 6.9. Ezekiel 6.9, I think, is the most remarkable verse in the Bible about the broken heart of God by sin. And Zephaniah 3.17, I think, is the counterpart to that. It's the most remarkable verse to me in the Bible of God's rejoicing over us when we do the right thing says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. But just as our sin breaks God's heart, when we walk with him on that love path, he's whistling a happy tune. He's got a song in his heart and a spring in his step as we walk with him on that love trail. We bring him joy. And also in your outline is the Luke 15, three different verses. That, those are the parables in Luke chapter 15 of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son, the lost son. And we see in those verses that it says over and over, there's joy in heaven when what happens? Or one sinner that repents because that relationship is restored. The thing that God made us for that He could love us. When we repent, now we're back in that loving relationship and it brings Him joy. All heaven rejoices. The scripture proclaims that God delights in us when we choose righteousness and love over sin and selfishness. 1 Chronicles 29.17 tells us that God takes pleasure in them that fear Him in those that hope in His mercy. 
Psalm 147, verse 11. It says, The Lord takes pleasure in them that fear Him, in those that hope... Oh, that's that's the one I just read, didn't I? First Chronicles 29, 17 does not read what I told you it read. <laughs> First Chronicles 29, 17 says, God has pleasure in uprightness. Psalm 147, 11 says, God takes pleasure in them that fear Him, in those that hope in His mercy. And in Psalm 149, verse 4, it says, For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Now in all three of those word passages, the Hebrew word for pleasure in those verses means to be pleased with, to approve of, to be satisfied with, to delight in, and to enjoy. That sounds like a great time. That's good stuff. That's what's in God's heart when we choose love and holiness and to do the right thing. To do that which we know to do. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 20, it reads, They that are of a froward heart or a crooked or perverse heart are abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. And in Proverbs 15, verse 8, it tells us something similar. It says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. All the outward religious stuff we want to do, if our heart is still selfish underneath, we might as well not even be doing all that religious stuff. It's garbage to God. It's refuse. It's abominable. It's disgusting. But, says the prayer of the upright is his delight. So it's our heart condition. Now the Hebrew word for delight in those two verses includes, of course, to have pleasure in or to delight over. But it also, when you research that word, it includes the idea that if God had been in our shoes, he would have made the same choices. Isn't that something? He delights when we do the right thing because he's, he knows... If I'd been there, I'd have done the same thing that Tim just did. How much joy that brings to God. What a remarkable idea. That our choices bring God the pleasure and joy of knowing that we are doing exactly what He would have done in the same situation. I mean, we, we often think of it the other way. like God is our example and we're going to do what He would do. And that's true. We're to imitate His example. But think of it from God's perspective. When we do that, He says... All right. He just did it exactly the way I would have. And we can experience some of a small picture of this joy uh, when, when we see our children make good decisions. Uh, Christopher, I always use him as an example. <laughs> he, uh, he, this last summer, he loves soccer. He plays soccer. He's a certified referee. Now he's a licensed coach. One of the youngest licensed coaches in the state of Michigan, I believe. Well, this last summer he had his first coaching opportunity. And so he had a team of, of kids and uh, I showed up and was watching these games and it was just fun to watch the, the kids enjoy it. Claire and Ben happened to be on his team. And he, you can talk to him about whether they listen to coach, I guess. <laughs> but it was fun to watch them play, but it was really fun to watch Christopher coach. Well, a remarkable thing happened. There was a, a young gal that was on his team, a, little, a girl, who she told him she really liked to play goalie, keeper. That's what she wanted to do. Now, she was not the most athletic gal. And you stick her in the middle of the team, you know, maybe that's one thing. But the keeper, that's kind of isolated. You're on your own. You know, your skill is going to make a, a definite change in the outcome. And she wasn't real athletic. And she, she, he put her in there as keeper the first day. And man, I have never, I'm telling you, I've never seen a worse goalkeeper. <laughs> I mean, this was bad. Where I was talking to Christopher afterwards, said, you know, 
does she understand these concepts? You know, <laughs> that the ball's not supposed to go in, but, but no, does she understand to do this, to do this, and you should coach her and do this. So I'm giving him all this coach stuff, do this, do this. And uh, he said, well, I, I think so. I mean, I'll talk to her. You know, she said she likes to play that position. Well, so then the next game he put her in, you know. And so Christopher, he's a very competitive guy. He likes to win. I mean, who, who doesn't, right? And he hates to lose, but really, who doesn't, right? But maybe, maybe, maybe I'm sharing a little too much. Right? But he's competitive, loves to win, and wanted to put his team in the best possible position to win. But he knew something even more important than that, that it would crush this little girl if he yanks her out. So, you know, through the whole season, she played one half as keeper. And I know there's some games they would have won if he'd have put somebody else in for the entire game. I mean, he didn't leave her in the whole time. He tried to put the team in good positions to win, tried to balance things out. But these are, this isn't college or high school where this really mattered, the win-loss record. He understood this is rec soccer. This is kids having fun. And he let that girl go out there and have fun. And he would encourage her. And let me tell you, as I watched him do that, with that girl and encourage her, that brought so much joy and pride to my heart as his father. Far more than an undefeated season. I mean, that's easy for us to understand and natural. That's the joy that we bring to the heart of our Creator when we do the right thing. You see, our choices, God has given us free will, and He's taken a risk, and trusted our heart to Him, and trusted His heart to us, I'm sorry. And our choices bring God either pain or joy. And what I want you to take away from today is not any discouragement. What I want you to take away today is that God watches your life. He sees every choice you make, and He is your biggest fan. He wants what's best for you more than anybody else on this planet. Nobody loves you more than He does. And when we do the right thing, God is overjoyed. But when we do choose selfishness and sin, we break His heart. Remember the statement of our Star Wars character at the beginning, Padme, the wife. She says, I'll read this statement to you again, and you can see the depth of the, the spiritual content right here in this statement. I don't know you anymore, Anakin. You're breaking my heart. I'll never stop loving you, but you're going down a path I can't follow. Likewise, when we choose to follow the path of sin and selfishness, we walk on a path on which God cannot join us, and we break His heart. The proper response for us is to resolve in our heart to never sin again. Because we never want to cause sorrow and pain to our loving Creator and Redeemer. If we do choose to sin, of course we know there is always forgiveness. 1 John 1 9 tells us this. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we do choose to sin, there is always forgiveness. But we must come to a point of decision in our life where we say, this day, I'm resolving in my heart to never sin again. And if we've never reached that point of decision with God, that's something you can do today. You can do business with God anytime. 
and say, from this point forward, I thank you, Father, that you've forgiven me through Jesus Christ of all my past sins. And from this time forward, I commit that I will not do that anymore. We must resolve in our hearts to choose life, to walk in agape love, and thereby to enjoy sweet fellowship with God and to bring Him joy. Having the context of this understanding, I want to leave you with Paul's admonition to the Christians at Ephesus. And thus it's the Holy Spirit's admonition to each one of us. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 to 8. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, and you'll bring your heavenly Father unspeakable joy.